This 1500 page book is Stephen Jay Gould's last magnus opus on evolutionary theory. Written over 20 years up to the final days of his life and published 20 years ago in the year 2002. Uh, does this great big book have any relevance to evolution and the study of paleontology today? And should you read Stephen Jay Gould? Hello and welcome to another paleontology video. My name is Benjamin Berger and in this video I wanted to explore the influence that Stephen Jay Gould had on paleontology and evolutionary theory. As any aspiring paleontologist living in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, Stephen Jay Gould was a legendary figure. For 25 years, he wrote essays for the Natural History uh, magazine, and he published uh, numerous books, often on theoretical aspects of evolution and how it works. Um, principally interested in what G.G. Simpson called the tempo and mode of evolution. That is, how quickly did evolution work to change organisms and how this change promoted and at other times diminished the diversity of life forms. Stephen Jay Gould's writing style is not very accessible, at least to me. But when reading uh, his sometimes convoluted path of complex sentence structures and wild train, uh, trains of random thought, you feel like you were reading and following along a story with someone that is truly brilliant and insightful. But what exactly was Gould writing about and does any of it make any sense 20 years later? The structure of evolutionary theory is Gould's super ambitious attempt to address everything about evolution. And it is a maddening maze of words and convoluted arguments uh, that stretch out passages into long trains of thought that are either really brilliant or kind of on the edge of lunacy. It's the house of leaves of science writing. <laughs> So what was Stephen Jay Gould trying to get at with this book? What was the reason for writing so much on the topic of evolution? Do all these words mean anything? When I was reading, I, I kept having flashbacks to when I was a student and the professor would assign us an article by Gould for us to read. And um, the one that I remember the most for being particularly dense and difficult to understand was Gould and Lee Wonton's 1979 paper. It was entitled The Spandrels of San Marco in the Panaglossin Paradigm, a Critique of the Adaptionist Program. At its basis, basically the article argues that there exists forms and structures in living organisms that only exist to support the structure itself. These are grown out of changes in the allometric scale, that is the, the size of the organism, or the ontogenetic growth, that is the organism's age. These features are due to physical and mathematical constraints of growth, and that these particular traits are not necessarily selected for, nor are they crafted by natural selection, but are part of the organism nevertheless. He used ceiling arches in cathedrals as an example of this type of structure of form which must exist to support the ceiling. Um, but they're highly ornamented um, to give kind of that false impression that they are designed for the decoration of the cathedral. 
The paper, you know, incited a lot of controversy in its day, and hence was, you know, frequently required reading in paleontology and evolutionary studies. Gould's other biggest contribution was how he viewed change through time. He saw that populations of organisms were living within the unique time period and geographic space that had just the right physiological conditions and requirements to ensure generational survival. And that during these long periods of peace and prosperity, organisms were simply existing within the statistical range of variation without changing as a group. But if the physical conditions and requirements suddenly change, the organisms are either required to adapt to that change through natural selection, or they die out and become extinct. This pattern of long periods of stasis or equilibrium are punctuated by rapid changes within a population that are subjected to changing physical conditions of the environment. He called this theory punctuated equilibrium in a famous paper with Niles Eldridge. Punctuated equilibrium would lead to a major validation uh, in the use of cladistic analysis. That is the branching pattern that represents a more relational or bioinformatic way of grouping organisms by monophyletic relationships. It's something you see every day in modern textbooks, but was nearly non-existent before the idea of punctuated equilibrium. Organizing organisms by their shared similarity, whether genetic or morphologic, and moving away from the mismeasurement of individual specimens that led to cultural bias, and as he wrote in detail, how all-out racism in its worst form. Cladograms dominate modern biological thought, replacing old figures of linear transcendence of evolution with branching cladograms. Uh, if new species originate quickly, then these you know branching events are themselves brief and kind of unworthy of focus. Now, while full of great ideas, um, Gould did have a fallacy. Uh, he tended to look backward at the long history of science rather than forward. He often constructed in his mind a cultural villain in the scientifically out-of-fashion version of evolutionary theory, exemplified in many of the out-of-date paleontology textbooks of his time. You're likely familiar with these, the progressive scale of continued improvement over a slow and gradual course toward the ultimate advancement of the organism. So Gould presents this distorted version of evolutionary theory as his primary enemy, his chief desperado. He was known to regale against the ideals of geological uniformitarianism, a two-century-old idea of the slow progression of sedimentation to build the thick sedimentary rock layer on Earth, and rather viewed Earth as being shaken up by short-term events like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs and wild swings in climate change. One of the things that keeps me reading Gould's work is that I'm always looking for some explanations as to the mechanisms that cause these patterns of evolution he observes in the fossil record. Gould grew up in New York City, learning about evolution initially through reading and the vast libraries he had, he had access to. Uh, it differs so much from my own childhood, raised in the Rocky Mountains, 
camping, hiking, skiing in the ever-changing natural environment. To me, the driving force of evolution and the fossil record is change itself and not the form of the organism. So today I'm skiing on several feet of snow on a cold January day. But in mid-July, the same path is a, as hot and full of green grass, and my body and the animals and plants must be able to handle both. My skis, on the other hand, are designed to move across deep snow, but in summer they will prove useless. I find the writings and experiments of authors like Theodonius Dabowski and Ernst Meyer uh, much more uh, insightful in the concepts of peripatric speciation through restrictions in gene flow within population genetics as a major contributing factor to rapid evolutionary change, a, a key point to the 1930s, 1940s modern synthesis of evolutionary theory. Since rapid changes in populations happen in the periphery, in these smaller isolated populations with limited geographic range, and then they sweep out if they're successful, this explanation resonates with me, and I'm always looking to see if Gould acknowledges them as well, which he does. But I also have the sense that Gould is seeing rapid change through the absence of a better and more complete fossil record. Uh, when the absence of data kind of confirms a theory, it only makes you look harder and searching for new fossils to fill in these gaps. And to me, this has been the driving force of paleontology in the new century. Now, one way to kind of explain this um, is to imagine that paleontology as a tiny window uh, looking out at a vast population of individual organisms. Observations of organisms when viewed from this tiny little window will appear rapid because you can't see the entire worldwide picture of everything. And so much of evolution happens in the periphery within small population sizes. So when a new novel form appears in that tiny little window, it only does so after that trait has become so successful as to dominate the larger population. Only then will it jump into existence in the window as if it came out of nowhere. But other explanations also exist, um, most notably geographic changes with migration of populations across geographic spaces with new species suddenly appearing in the window during these times of environmental change. And then there's also the issue of random changes and mutations in the genetic expression of phenotypes that can appear. If advantageous, these traits can quickly spread through generations upon generations of organisms living and dying. Now, all sorts of novel mechanisms can contribute to variation from viruses, enterons, and eukaryotic organisms, the breaking apart of recombination of chromosomes and other genetic encoding, um, symbiotic relationships. They're all, they're all working to reshuffle the cell's DNA and RNA during replication helping to ensure novel traits and characters are found within each generation. This is most you know, recently exemplified by the rapid evolution of the coronavirus uh, and its variants. So yes, I think Gould is relevant to science today, um, but 
His contribution is masked by his dense writing, which I think sadly mis is misunderstood by the general public, um, who see their own bias in his writings. Uh, even creationists and people who don't understand evolution frequently misinterpret his writings. So if I could do the disservice of crafting a single sentence <laughs> to encapsulate Gould's greatest book, um, I would state that evolution is not a linear, slow path, but a convoluted maze of dead ends of quickly changing directions and pathways and long periods of boredom or in other words a big bushy tree of an ever fractioning and changing and unfolding diversity of life and to explain all that you really need a really big book Hey, thanks for tagging along with me today. I, I really appreciate it. This is a fun and exciting video to make on Stephen Jay Gould. Um, you may be wondering, did I finish this book? <laughs> I read large sections of it, but I didn't read it from cover to cover because it's one of those books that's almost impossible to do that with. I have links down below of other books that I would recommend by Stephen Jay Gould if you're interested, as well as some of his more famous articles.